Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about a variety of ways that we could administer heat as a therapeutic modality. And I mentioned there that we'd spend an entire video talking about IR, or infrared light therapy. And that's because infrared light therapy, although it is technically under the classification of heat, it works quite a bit differently than regular heat does. Okay? And to understand that, let's actually take a look at this picture up here at the top. So this is really just showing the spectrum of light, or at least a part of the spectrum of light. Over here on the left, we see the visible spectrum. These are the colors that we can see. So on the far left over here, we have purple. Really, it's called violet. And then we have indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red over here. Then if we look at the right over here, in this black all the way to white, it's not technically black to white. Uh, but this is the near-infrared and infrared parts of the spectrum. So over here in this circle, this is the near-infrared spectrum, and everything to the right of that over here is the infrared spectrum. So in these little two circles right here, really what's in this red rectangle, this is blown up here at the top. So this end of the visible spectrum right here in this circle, this is really from about 750 nanometers down. And you can see here's the limit about 620. Technically it goes a little bit below that. Uh, but these are the wavelengths, about 620 to 750 nanometers. That's really what's in here in this circle, and that's red light. And as we go above 750 nanometers up to about 810, 830, 850, we start to get into the near-infrared part of the spectrum, and above that is going to be the infrared spectrum. Now, why is it important to understand this? Well, first of all, as we go toward the right here, notice that the wavelengths are increasing. So we go from 630 nanometers all the way up to 850. So as we go to the right, the wavelength is increasing. Now, when we compare wavelength to energy, they have an inverse relationship. So as the wavelength increases, the energy of the light decreases. What that means is that if we look at red light, near-infrared, or infrared, it has a fairly high wavelength, and so that means it has a low energy. If we go to the other side over here is violet, and then to the left of that is ultraviolet, which we don't see, uh, those are lower wavelengths and therefore higher energies. And so if you get ultraviolet light shown on your skin, it's going to penetrate through to deeper tissues, of course, but it's high enough energy to cause DNA mutation and all sorts of other kinds of cellular damage. Now the red light, near-infrared, and infrared light is higher wavelength, and so it's lower in energy. And so it still penetrates through the skin and into deeper tissues where it has biological effects, but it's not high enough in energy to cause DNA damage or cellular damage. And when we think of a therapy, right, it has to have some benefit to the patient, but it also can't cause a significant amount of damage. Well, ultraviolet light would clearly cause damage to DNA. That's why we don't use ultraviolet light. Of course, we protect against ultraviolet, but infrared won't cause DNA damage. Okay? Now, there are several methods to deliver infrared light. One, we can use an infrared lamp, which you shine on the skin at a certain distance away from the skin. You can use infrared light pads, which you put directly on the skin. Or you can use an infrared probe, which you move along the skin and it delivers the light. We'll talk about these three techniques in more detail in just a little bit, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about how infrared light therapy actually works. And to do that, here we have a cell. The outer border here in dark blue is the cell membrane. Inside here is the cytoplasm. The circle is the nucleus with the DNA contained inside. And then up at the top left of the cell is the mitochondria. And then we have these light waves being shown on the cell. Now, when we use the infrared light lamp or the light pads or the probe, sometimes the settings can be toggled a little bit, but generally the light that's emitted is going to be red, near infrared, and infrared light. The red light below 780 nanometers is visible, but it doesn't have the same biological effects that the near infrared or infrared light does. Now, infrared light is not in the visible spectrum, so we can't see that light. However, when we use the red light with it, even though that light below 780 nanometers doesn't have the same biological effects as infrared light, it does serve as a good way to know that the machine is on and working.
Now, the way that these infrared light waves actually exert biological effects on cells is by triggering certain actions of the mitochondria. The first is through the production of nitric oxide. So remember, nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. Well, if you are locally increasing nitric oxide production, you're going to get local vasodilation, which means increased blood flow to that area. Where we're headed is that infrared light therapy actually accelerates wound healing, especially in the acute phase of a wound. So if somebody has an inversion ankle sprain and they have some ruptured ligaments and you want to get those healed pretty quickly, you might actually try infrared light therapy because that increased nitric oxide production in that area of the ankle sprain is going to lead to vasodilation in that area and so increase blood delivery to that area. And of course blood brings nutrients and the more nutrients you have, the quicker that tissue is going to heal. The second thing that infrared light therapy does is it increases the production of ATP by the mitochondria. Now when you have increased ATP, it leads to the production of more cyclic AMP. So this is just a small molecule that's related to ATP. But when cyclic AMP accumulates, and you get more and more of it, it triggers this cascade of protein and enzyme activation that terminates in the activation of two transcription factors. One is called June, one is called FOS. Strange names, right? Well, June and FOS are transcription factors, and so they can dimerize, so they can combine, basically, when they enter the nucleus into a combined transcription factor called AP1, and AP1 is going to exert some biological effects that we're going to see in just a minute. Now, the other thing that infrared light therapy does is it actually triggers the production of reactive oxidative species by the mitochondria. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, reactive oxidative species are bad, right? You've got the free radical theory of aging. How can reactive oxidative species be good? Well, there's this thing called hormesis. So hormesis is this concept that when you have a small amount of reactive oxidative species it actually can serve some benefit. It's when you get them out of whack and there's tons of reactive oxidative species. That's when you have things like chronic inflammation and so forth. But this is just a small increase in reactive oxidative species. And it's enough to trigger this activation of proteins right here. So this increased production of reactive oxidative species triggers the activation of this protein kinase D. Protein kinase D leads to the activation of this protein in purple called NF-kappa B. The short story here is there's a regulatory protein called I-kappa B that keeps NF-kappa B inactivated. So protein kinase D phosphorylates I-kappa B, which allows it to let go of NF-kappa B. And when it lets go of NF-kappa B, NF-kappa B can then enter the nucleus. It's a transcription factor also, and so it binds to the DNA and is going to upregulate certain genes. Now collectively, AP1 right here from our second pathway and NF-kappa B from our third right here, these are going to lead to an increased production of proteins that are growth factors, that are involved in cell proliferation, that are involved in cell motility, so movement of certain cells to the area or around the area, and also deposition of more extracellular matrix. Now you can imagine that all four of these things are going to be excellent for cellular and tissue repair. So here's some of the basic effects of having these types of proteins upregulated. So we get angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels, particularly capillaries that sprout from larger blood vessels to supply the area and get increased healing. Remember, you have to get increased blood flow to an area to get it to heal. We also get more collagen synthesis. Remember, collagen provides that tensile strength in the extracellular matrix. Also, if there's any scar tissue necessary, um, the collagen is going to make up that tissue as well. Also, what we see is that muscle regeneration with the use of IR light therapy is going to be greater than atrophy. So usually if you have something like an inversion ankle sprain, you're not going to be using that ankle as much, right? You're not going to be weight bearing on it because it's painful. Um, and you're generally not going to be moving it. So with infrared light therapy, we can actually trigger uh, more regeneration of those muscle or that muscle tissue, which prevents atrophy. Okay? In order to maintain the tissue, the regeneration has to at least equal the atrophy or be greater than it. We also get neurogenesis and cartilage synthesis. Again, if we have an acute injury, we can have nerve damage. And also, depending on the injury type, we can also have cartilage damage. And we also get increased bone formation. Don't think that an inversion ankle sprain is the only thing we can use this for. You can even use this for a fracture. Again, 
the same principles are going to apply. We need more blood flow to the area. We need more collagen synthesis, especially if it's bone, right? Because bone is largely collagen. And all of these things really just culminate in the fact that we have increased wound healing, increased tissue repair, and increased relief from pain. Now let's get into the specific infrared light therapies. So the first we'll talk about is the infrared lamp here in the center. Uh, this is actually the one I've seen the least used. Um, we actually see the pads and the probes used a little bit more. But the infrared lamp delivers energy through radiation. Of course, it's shining directly on the skin. And for the infrared lamp, typically the treatment duration is going to be about 15 to 20 minutes. This is actually longer than what we see for the probe and the pads. And the setup is the light should be perpendicular to the patient. Okay? We'll look at a picture of this in just a minute. The closer the lamp is, the hotter it's going to get. The patient's skin, where you're applying the light, should feel warm. But the thing you have to take into consideration is that the closer the lamp is, the faster the skin's going to heat and the more it's going to heat. And so you can actually burn the skin if the lamp gets too close. This is where you have to take into the consideration those precautions and contraindications, like impaired mentation and impaired sensation in particular. Okay? And remember, with infrared light therapy, you're not setting a particular temperature like you are for the other thermotherapies, right? We're looking at a wavelength of light. The infrared is 780 to 1400 nanometers. So here is a basic setup of the infrared lamp. Okay? Very simple. We have the skin over here, and you can see here that the infrared lamp is perpendicular to the skin. So if you look at the basic direction, it's going perpendicular to the skin. Now, the thing I wanted to show you here, which might seem obvious to you, is if you put that lamp closer, then those light waves are going to be more condensed on a smaller area of the skin, but it's the same number of light waves, so it's going to be more intensity on that region of skin. So the idea is, the closer you put the lamp, the hotter it's going to be, and the more risk you are for burning. Also, if you're closer, if you choose to do that, then the duration of the treatment is going to need to be a lot shorter. The further the lamp is away, the longer the treatment duration is going to be. However, this is the technique that I've actually seen the least. The other two here seem to be more common, and those are using infrared light pads and infrared light probes, and there's a lot of variations on those. So we'll start with the light pads. And here's the machine that we use, and here's the basic setup. Okay? So, one, you'll have to obviously have the light pads plugged in. On ours, it's kind of on the left side, and I'll show you a video of that in just a minute. We have to select the light pad setting. So you would click this button right here once you have the light pads plugged in. And then you look at this box and just make sure that light pad is shown there in green. Now you look at these settings over here, you have various colors or parts of the spectrum that you can apply. So there's infrared, that's on. Red is also on. Remember, infrared light is what actually has a therapeutic effect. The red light does not, but it's a good way of making sure that the machine is still on. There's also this blue setting over here. Uh, blue can actually be used for a different purpose, which involves wound care. That will be the topic of a different video. Uh, for ours, it doesn't come in even uh, minutes, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 9, 10, and so forth. It actually goes like 9.50, but again, just live with it. That's the treatment duration. And then over here is the dosage, basically the intensity. The dosage is given in joules per square centimeter. Um, this does not mean 10 joules per square centimeter. The 10 or 9 or 11, whatever it happens to be, is just a, a measure of the intensity. It's not the exact value. Okay. Um, when you turn the machine on and set it to light pad, these are the settings that are automatically programmed in. So this is what we use. And every machine has the potential to be different, and every clinic may be different, so you should inquire about exactly uh, how your clinic does things and how your machine operates. And then once you have the light pads on the patient, you click Start here. Let's watch a quick video and see how that works. So here's our machine. I'm going to take these light pads you can see over here on the far left, and you just plug them in. You can see a little thing there that actually says light pad. So make sure that's plugged in all the way. And then over here, I'm going to select light pad. All those settings pop up. Everything's good. And then I take the light pads and I simply put them on the region of the skin that I want to accelerate healing with. So in this case, it's just lateral to the spine in the thoracolumbar region. Okay? And once they're on the skin and where I want them, I hit start. Once I hit start, you'll see the red light. 
Now remember, that's not infrared, that's just red, but the red tells you that it's working. And I don't want that radiation to get in anybody's eyes, so we just take a towel and basically cover that. Okay? Um, this guy's not at any risk of really looking into that light, but if somebody else is in the room, it's really just common courtesy to them. So we cover that to make sure that no light is able to get in anybody's eyes. So basic idea here, we have two sides of the light pad, one that doesn't emit light and the other that does emit light. So here's my left inversion ankle sprain. I'm going to take that light pad and put it directly on the skin. Now you have a malleolus there. Uh, it's irregularly shaped as a whole. So some parts of the skin there are not going to be in direct contact with the light pad. That is okay because remember the light pad actually radiates light. The light is still going to travel across that space and hit the skin and penetrate through the skin to the mitochondria of cells. That's okay. And remember, as you saw in the video, um, you're going to see some of that light kind of escaping. And so what we want to do to make sure that the infrared light doesn't hit anybody's eyes and people aren't looking into it, is put a towel over it. Just common courtesy, but it protects the eyes. So again, for the light pads here, let's put them on the scapular region this time. Um, the duration of the treatment is going to be about 10 minutes. Again, our, our machine says 950, but 10 minutes, it's close enough. And the intensity should already be set. Uh, again, check with your clinic, check with your particular machine. But in general, it should really just emit enough light to give warmth, enough that the patient can tolerate, um, and also in accordance with the patient's preference. If the intensity is too high, of course, dial it down. If the patient can't feel anything and they do have intact sensation, then raise the intensity up. So it's pretty common sense. The parameters are very straightforward. Now for the light probe, it's the same kind of thing. You want to check with your clinic and you want to check with your particular machine. Our machine might have a weird setting compared to yours. Ours is an intensity of six and you do it for six to seven minutes. You can even raise the intensity up a little bit and then the duration drops. So again, you want to check with how your facility does things and also with the machine. But the idea of how you actually administer this is you take that probe, uh, so this part right here, it kind of looks like an ultrasound head, and you turn the machine on, it'll be emitting red and infrared light, and you just move it in the skin, not in circles, but really just in a line like this, okay? Move it in a line. The thing you want to make sure when you're using a light probe is you don't just set it on the skin like that and just leave it. One of the stories we have is there's a chair in the clinic and somebody accidentally left a light probe on it and it burned a hole in the chair. Now, to be fair, they left it there quite a while, well beyond six minutes. Okay, but the idea is if you leave there, it can burn the skin. Okay, so with the light probe, you do the specified duration at the specified intensity, but you keep that light probe moving over the surface of the skin. Okay? Never have it stop statically on any part of the body. It keeps moving in this straight line. You can do it vertically like this, or you can do it horizontally as I was doing it before. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how infrared light therapy is used and why it is used. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.